I found two very important metrics that will help me buy the best dividend stocks for the long term, especially as someone that invests a small amount. And this all started with a very popular and high yielding dividend stock that I actually decided to sell after four years of holding on to it. I'll be honest, I was really new to investing at the time, so it's very possible that I got this suggestion from like a YouTuber to invest into AT&T without doing my own additional research. But I was definitely aware of their worldwide presence with providing internet and technology such as cell phones. The first thing I noticed when I invested into AT&T was their high dividend yield, which isn't super far from what it is currently. And that obviously makes sense for someone that wants to live off passive income as fast as they can, especially when they invest a small amount on a weekly, daily, or monthly basis. But since then, I gained more knowledge and that knowledge has helped me really figure out what type of portfolio I wanna have. And that type of portfolio is one filled with stocks and ETFs that have a long-term history of profit growth and consistently paying and increasing their dividends. But ironically, after watching a YouTube video pretty recently by Dividendology, who makes great YouTube videos, by the way, on finance and dividend investing, I realized that AT&T is probably not going to be the best position to help me, and I learned of two new metrics that would actually help me find better dividend paying stocks. Living off dividends is different for everyone. Everyone has a certain dollar amount that they need to live off dividends, so everyone has a different dollar amount that they need every single month from passive income. But with the help of inflation and the Federal Reserve doing their best to keep inflation increasing by an average of 2% every single year, what you need now as far as living expenses go is definitely gonna be worth more in the future. That's why the dividend CAGR or the compound annual growth rate is so important. That's essentially the percentage change of the dividend yield between two years. For example, if in 2020, uh, stocks dividend yield was 1% and in 2021 it was 2% then the dividend CAGR in that case should be 100% it literally doubled and ideally you want the dividend CAGR to be higher than the average rate of inflation which again is 2% with AT&T its dividend CAGR was mostly below 2% up until 2007 and from that point on it unfortunately got to the negative and that was immediately following a failed acquisition with Time Warner which sent the share price dropping really hard and speaking of share price when you pull up a stock on a brokerage app like Robinhood, for example, the first thing you're gonna see is its share price history or the price return. It's just the general history of the share price over whatever given period of time you're looking at. But it doesn't take into an account how much returns you would be making if you reinvested profits like dividends, for example. That's what total return does. In recent history, AT&T actually has had a pretty positive price and total return, which makes it a very attractive company. However, when you look further back, as into like the three year and the five year price and total return history, it doesn't look as great even with the dividend payoff. Being someone that invested into this company back when it was in the late 20s to early $30 per share range, I wasn't super confident that the share price would actually go back up to the point where I would be back in the green and the dividend history didn't look that great either. So with all that, that's why I ultimately sold out of my AT&T position. When you invest a small weekly amount like I do, you wanna make sure that every dollar you put into your portfolio is working as hard as it can to make you passive returns and long-term returns. That's why when you're investing in dividend stocks, it's important to make sure you're investing in stocks that have a history of consistently increasing their dividend payout, but also a long-term history of increasing its share price. With that in mind, I took the roughly $122 that I made after selling AT&T for a loss, by the way, and I actually bought into Kroger, which is a very popular grocery store chain that I actually shop at myself pretty often. After selling AT&T and buying a little over two shares of Kroger, my projected annual dividends for the next year dropped by $10, but Kroger not only has a very impressive dividend CAGR, but its price and total return are both positive for the past three years and five years. So even though the past history of a company doesn't necessarily dictate how it's gonna do in the future, it can give you an idea of how safe that position may be. So with Kroger, I feel like I will definitely have a better chance of making more money in the the long term when it comes to its profit growth and its dividend growth, especially in comparison to AT&T but that's just me. There are other positions that I'm looking into as well, like Williams-Sonoma, which does have a pretty low dividend yield, but its dividend growth is great and it's gone up over 100% in the past year, including over 50% year to date. But in the meantime, I'm gonna continue looking at my portfolio to make sure it all fits to what I'm trying to do overall with it, including seeing if there's any positions that I might actually wanna sell so I can buy into other companies. But when it comes to growth and dividends, I still had a pretty good month even before I sold AT&T, and I actually talk about that in this 
this video about how I did overall for the month of June, including how much I made, what companies I bought, what companies I sold, how much I made in dividends, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested, make sure you check that out. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. And until next time, as always, take care.